Reggie here, your friendly neighborhood bodybuilder and comic book collector, and I want to welcome you to another one of my videos. In this video, I sit down and have a great conversation with the founder and CEO of Boom Studios, Ross Ritchie. And he and I had a fantastic conversation talking about a host of different topics. I will tell you that Ross is a fountain of information when it comes to the history of comics. I learned a lot from this conversation, but I also had a fantastic time, and I think you will as well. Stay tuned for the video. Ross, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. I might tear my shirt off and grab my sword. <laughs> You know, it would be terrible. I do not look nearly as good as you. You would feel very sorry for me. But I just want to thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm such a huge fan. I watch you all the time. Love your stuff, man. Thank you, brother. I definitely appreciate that. And unfortunately, I don't look as good as I once did with my shirt off. But I don't still have my sword, though. <laughs> I still have the sword. That is actually sitting back behind me. But... I do want to thank you for coming on the show. And what's really cool about us coming together right now is that it was very organic. And what I mean by that is that I put up a post on Instagram and yep. you liked it. And then you started to comment on that post. And then we had a little bit of a back and forth that led to us being here right now. And what was really cool about that is that, yes, it was organic, but what you were commenting on was some stuff that I wasn't aware of before. And, and that's one of the cool things that I like about comics is that there is so much rich history out there with comics, with the comics themselves, but also with things that take place around the comics. So can you take a moment and tell us a little bit about what that post was, but more importantly, what was it that resonated with you in that post? Well, um, you were posting about ROM and uh, you put up a post about the first issue of ROM and that's a comic book that I bought off the rack. And after Star Wars came out in 1977, there was a whole raft of uh, science fiction comic books that were based on other merchandise, whether it be movies or toy uh, series, whatever. And that was a part of that, that sort of, those were the things that got me into comics. Mm -hmm. I love science fiction. And science fiction was my first love before superheroes. And so Ron in particular has a special place in my heart because I got the toy uh, for Christmas one year and then I bought the comic and I became a fan of the comic. So it, it was it was that part. Like, I did not know that Rom was a toy. Like, I knew that it was a comic. I didn't realize it was a toy as well. So that was like part of what captured my attention. And then you you sent me a link to the commercial. Do you remember that? Yes, absolutely. That commercial lives in my memory forever because I used to watch that commercial and eagerly anticipate the Rom toy. And, and by the way, the, that toy line consisted only of Rom. Hmm. That's, that came out nothing else it failed and the the comic book became much more successful than the toy to the point where people have no idea that it was ever a toy there you go and i actually want to play that commercial for you i have it i want to play it and then i want to get your reaction on the other side of this so hold on this is rum the space knight you can imagine he comes from another galaxy with his flashing neutralizer Activate ROM. You can imagine he has rockets to blast into space and a translator that communicates with lights and sounds. You can even imagine his respirator lets him breathe in any atmosphere. ROM comes with the three plug-in accessories shown. Nine-volt battery not included. ROM, the Space Knight, an electronic toy new from Parker Brothers. So that was yeah. super grainy. Super grainy picture there. Uh, but I'm curious, does it... Does it ring true for you today the way that it did back in the day? Well, first of all, what's not to love? And then <laughs> second, the thing that's very hard to understand in context is that uh, Star Trek, um, the show, was prematurely canceled after three seasons in the 60s. Mm. And then it was gone. And it came on reruns in the early 70s, and that's how it built its audience. 
but there was very little merchandising around Star Trek. There was some, uh, I don't want to say there was none, but the key is between that and Planet of the Apes, there was really nothing in the space that you would consider nerdy or geeky or to collect or to get into Star Wars hits in 77. And then you have this sort of wave of science fiction that happens in the US. And there's all these different companies that are trying to crack the nut of Star Wars. And for me, because I was so starved for this kind of entertainment, you know, I was in because there wasn't there weren't choices to be had. You know, my my staff teases me because when they talk Star Trek, I can wade in and talk about it, but they don't consider me a Star Trek fan. And I always try to explain that every comic book collector was a Star Trek fan uh, that's my age because you had nothing else. Yeah. Right. So, you know, anything that had any science fiction or fantasy or anything, you watched it, you loved it. And so, Rom, for me, you know, in particular, I think knights have a real appeal to boys. Mm. And so I loved science fiction. And when you told me he was a space knight, I mean, that's all I needed to know. And exactly. I could ignore the fact that his head looks like a box and like he's got the very, you know, the articulation is not very strong. The character design is not particularly imaginative. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the other, you know, it also it flashed and it made noise, which is something that, you know, that you have to remember those Star Wars figures, the original Star Wars figures, they're, they're bricks. You know, they have no articulation. The fact that you could get noises out of that. And, you know, so I was in. And that it also lit up and everything. I mean, I think I read that the eyes were originally supposed to be green, but because Parker Brothers was trying to be a little cheap, they just did them as red. And, and all of those things are, you know, to some degree, the, the, the few points of articulation, the, just the beeping, and there were no follow up, you know, toys to go with it. I think all of those things partially like led to the failure ultimately of the ROM toy. Um, but what was, what's really cool about a lot of this is that. Over the last uh, few months on my channel, I've been spending time talking about, you know, various toy lines and cartoons and how they intersect with comics. And that's what really resonated from some of the things that you share with me. Like I've spoken about uh, G.I. Joe and Transformers and, and Thundercats because those are from my childhood. But it was like you helped me to understand that there was a generation, if you will, that intersected before the okay. ones that I'm familiar with. And so again, that that's part of what kind of captured my attention. But but you've spoken about this uh, a little bit already, and I want to dig into some of this a little bit more. When we spoke uh, previously, you talked about how um, there was a thirst for, co for space stuff and for merchandising and for toys. Mm -hmm. And you talked a little bit about how Marvel was kind of in trouble at the time and mm -hmm. how things turned around for them with Star Wars and the relationship between Star Wars and the comics. Can you talk a little bit more about like what was happening, how Star Wars, if you will, saved Marvel? Because I think that that kind of sets up context for some things that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Yeah, so Stan Lee was the editor-in-chief of Marvel during the 60s. As you go into the early 70s, the company is sold from Martin Goodman to Cadence Corporation. And when that happens, Stan kicks himself upstairs to become the publisher. And his protege, Roy Thomas, takes over as editor in chief. And during this time period, Marvel really doesn't do licensing. But basically, Roy talks Stan into paying $75, which Stan thinks is way too much money uh, for Conan. Mm. Okay. Mm. And the rest is history. And that becomes a massive hit. And so that's like 1970, 1971. And then um, Marvel does well under Roy's guidance. And then there's a change of editor-in-chief, uh, Marv Wolfman, Lynn Wine, uh, Archie Goodwin. Uh, um, I think Jerry Conway is in there. And there's actually an issue of the Fantastic Four where they battle their way through the Marvel offices and the editor-in-chief door has all the different names crossed out because mm. uh, some of the editors in chief, I think Jerry only lasted like two months mm. and, and then he quit. And so what happens is, is this period of chaos and destabilization and um, nobody was really paying attention to 
like all the pe- all the decisions that were being made were being made creatively and not for business reasons. And so Roy had been the editor in chief and had a track record of getting the correct license with Conan. And he gets wind of Star Wars mm-hmm. and he gets excited about Star Wars and he talks Marvel into licensing Star Wars. And basically Marvel was in a place where they were going to go bankrupt and Star Wars, the first issue through the various printings sells a million copies. And that basically paves the way to turn them out of bankruptcy. And then the next thing that happens is uh, Stan appoints Jim Shooter as the editor in chief. And Jim kind of like organizes the team better and he like creates a stronger framework, gets the trains running on time and the, and the turnaround happens. And then they have a very glorious 1980s. Check that out. I did not know that. Again, you continue to like share such fantastic information. Like, you know, one of the things that I did know about was um, was some of the editorial changes, not all of them, like the, the two two month stint. So that's a little bit of a surprise there. Um, but but just all of the dynamics of what was actually happening at Marvel, I find fascinating because you don't necessarily have that history i don't think captured or documented somewhere it is through like the oral that we're doing right now that we continue to kind of share some of these these stories and happenings over what what happened and again this is what i was alluding to that i really enjoy is that you can be reading the comics and you can enjoy them but there's a lot of other stuff that happens around that you know so a million comics uh to, to you know that came out of the star wars collaboration turns things around for marvel any clue how much they actually paid for that licensing? I'm certain that it wasn't 75 bucks for Conan, but I'm, I'm curious. Any thoughts there? No, I think it was probably around that number because George Lucas was a Marvel Comics fan. Mm. And he um, sent, uh, he basically wanted to do the comic. And he regarded the comic at this point, like like a lot of the thinking behind it was that the comic book was an ad for whatever the license was. So it's an ad for the movie. And one of the best examples of this is the very first piece of Star Wars merchandise is a movie poster that is not a movie poster. It's Howard Shaken, Drew, who's the artist on the first like eight issues, or maybe 10 of Star Wars. He drew a promotional poster that's very much looks like a movie poster. It's stylistically design wise very similar to the original a new hope movie poster and he drew that and he and roy there are pictures up on the internet of he and roy are wearing star wars shirts and they went down to san diego comic-con and they gave those posters away for free to try to seed in the comic book reader market that there was this very different science fiction fantasy movie that was coming and it's hard to to sort of understand what a massive departure that film was uh, it was hard to even tell people what it was like uh, to explain what a Jedi is and there are droids. And I mean, and it a long time ago in a galaxy far away, you know, yeah. it's just really mind blowing. And so George was actively chasing Marvel to do the book. And so the money that he was going to make off the comic or the, the studio 20th Century Fox was going to make off the, the comic was not the point. And so they were very happy to do a deal at a cheap number. But, you know, they got a royalty on the back end. And so every issue that sold, they got paid. And so they did just fine. And uh, but that's George was always very forward thinking. And as a comic book fan himself, he, he was also a partial owner in a comic book shop in New York City called Super Snipe. Yes. Brother, uh, in- I didn't know what you were going to say to that question, but I'm glad that I asked it now because, I mean, again, so how big of a comic book nerd are you? <laughs> because there, oh, I, I did not expect these answers. Listen, uh, there's there's people that are better at this than me, and their names are like Paul Levitz and Mark Wade, but I feel pretty confident that I'm on the shelf underneath. So I'm not going to take on Wade. Um, he, he can take me down. I can't take on Tom Brevoort. Um, or, or, or Paul Levitz, but I'm, let's say I'm, what, what is the, uh, uh, I'll say I'm not a 30th level uh, uh, comic book historian, but I, I'll, call, I'll say I'm a 20th level. You're, you're definitely up there. There's no doubt about that. And, and I do want to end this conversation to come back a little bit to why 
um, toy companies and things like that come to publishers, comic book publishers specifically. So I want to put a pin in that one just for a moment. And I want to continue on with the ROM conversation because again, this all sets us up for some things that we want to get to. But in doing my research, what I realized was that ROM was actually created by a trio of gentlemen who basically sold the patent to, to Parker Brothers. And at the time, Parker Brothers was basically known for board games. That was their gig. But I think, but I think because of like the success of Star Wars, people were, um, and by people, I mean companies, were excited about the possibility of uh, some of this sci-fi type of stuff. And so they bought that patent and they they bought uh, ROM, which wasn't named ROM at the time. It was actually named COBOL after the programming language, but they changed the name Parker Brothers did. But they turned to the House of Ideas Marvel and said, help us to create a backstory and a comic for uh, for ROM, which they did. So um, you already indicated that, that you read the toy and the comic back in the day, but I'm curious whether you want to elaborate on like, how you felt about the comic at the time, having the toy in your hand and reading the comic, like what was that experience like for you as, as a young man? Well, that, that was sort of my world getting into comics. So, you know, my first, my first comic is Fantastic Four, but they didn't have any action figures. Mm. Um, and there were some that were made before I had any access to them and they were gone and there were no conventions and I couldn't, there was no mail order that I could get my hands on them. And so here comes Star Wars and I can buy the action figures and I can buy the comic. Here comes ROM and I can get the, get the, the toy for Christmas because uh, it was so much more expensive than I could afford uh, on my, um, you know, sort of the money that I can make. And then I could get the comic. And uh, the same thing happened with Battlestar Galactica. And so it was just so exciting to be in a place where I could read the stories and then I could go play in my bedroom and have all these space adventures. Thank you for that. That's super helpful. And again, I, I think people always have to kind of think back to what things were like back then. It's not like it is now, right? It, it is a little different. And so um, I, I can only imagine what it was like back then. You know, I, I remember I was a big G.I. Joe fan the, of the toy. I never knew the comic existed, to be honest with you. It wasn't until later on that I realized that, it, oh, it's a comic. I'm literally reading G.I. Joe right now. I'm on like issue five. And wow. I'm actually enjoying it. It's a good read, but it's like, it's one of those cool things to be able to go back and read some of that stuff that you missed when you were younger and actually be able to enjoy it. So I, I kind of dig that. I'm going to throw this thought bomb on you, Reggie, and then we're going to move forward. <laughs> but uh, that that is an originally uh, the G.I. Joe pitch that Larry Hama did, the issues that you're reading. That's a rejected shield pitch. Really? Yep. You could see it. Yep. I, I, you can kind of see it. They're, they're, I mean, interesting. Yeah. Can you imagine if that would, if Marvel would have held on to that and done that as their Shield comic. Shield would have been incredible. Yep. You know, because GI Joe was incredible. I remember standing in front of the t the TV, being captivated by what was playing out on the screen in front of me because G.I. Joe was fantastic. And the action figures, which I, in doing the research, realized that the action figures were based upon the Star Wars action figure because of the success of that by Kenner. They literally just kind of stole it and did their own thing, you know? Yeah, is, if, you, if you go back and you look at the original Star Wars line, mm -hmm. they larger Chewbacca, larger Boba Fett, right? Larger characters. That was to mimic the original G.I. Joe size. Mm -hmm. Right, the, the 12 inch, the big G.I. Joe, which I think there were only four of them yeah. representing each branch. And again, I, I've done some of this research be for other videos that I've done. And it was cool, again, to kind of see that there was some stuff that came before. And it's like it's all tying together, which, again, is, is really cool for me to see. I think, by the way, why ROM didn't work was okay. the size of the toy was in between. It wasn't the three inch and it wasn't the 12 inch. And it was too expensive. Yep, yep. Um, I, I, so I want to I want to get to the point that I put a pin in a hot second ago, mm -hmm. and and it's this idea of well, it's a question of why is it that the the toy lines come to publishers, comic book publishers, 
and work with them to create these backstories and to basically raise the profile of their intellectual property because they could potentially do it themselves, but they, they come and they, they do a publication. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on like why we have constantly seen that throughout history. Like what's the rationale there? Well, um, if you, you wouldn't go to Marvel comics when they're publishing comics in 1980 and ask them to make a toy. That's true. From That's the true. ground up. That's right? true. So there, so Marvel's area of, of expertise is storytelling and heroic storytelling for boys at that point. Mm -hmm. Now they're a lot more multidimensional now, but back then the whole focus was to make comics for boys, which was the demographic for something like ROM. And so um, you see with these toy companies that they stay in their lane. They're like, I know how to make a toyetic toy. I know how to make something that boys want to play with. And now I'm going to take it and I'm going to have somebody that understands storytelling for boys that's going to go create the story around it. Yep. And and again, um, that I guess that's why uh, Marvel, and I don't know about now, but back then used to be called the House of Ideas because that's essentially what they did was, was partner up with people and bring the toy to life. And, and what was fascinating, I remember I was reading, um, it was like assistant editor month. It was some issue that I was reading and it was written around like Twinkies. And I was yep. like, if that's not a plant and a setup, I don't know what is like, it was a planet that was shaped like a Twinkie and it was all about hostess. And I'm like, you have to love that Marvel probably got a nice chunk of money to basically do a, a 16 or whatever number of page advertorial for Twinkies, you know? Yeah, that's an issue of Marvel team up. I know the one you're talking about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we clearly read the same source material here. <laughs> so as you pointed out earlier in this, in this, um, this discussion, the, the comic, the ROM comic actually outlasted the, uh, the toy itself. I think the toy sold somewhere south of 300,000 copies, but the comic actually ran for, I believe, 75 issues. And I think partly because of everything that we've discussed, like the toy wasn't the greatest toy, but the comic was actually pretty cool, was yep. well-written, well-drawn, and also captured the attention of, of young boys. Yep. Yeah. And the comic book was written by Bill Mantlo, who also created Rocket Raccoon and the Guardians of the Galaxy franchise. There you go. There you go. All right. So I want to I want to switch gears just a little bit. And I want to talk about another toy line that basically came out around this same time of ROM. And I'm specifically talking about Micronauts. And, and you smile as I say it. Um, so I was trying to do some research on Micronauts. And, and it was like trying to follow the bouncing ball, trying to understand like, so who's on first and who owns this thing and where did it come from? Um, I It was convoluted to me, but I have a feeling that you're going to be able to simplify this for us. So can you give us a, a rundown of Micronauts? Absolutely. So uh, Star Wars hits and science fiction is hot. And at, you see these entrepreneurs that are, you know, the guys that co-create ROM or an example where they go find a bigger company to sell the idea to. Uh, with this, the guy, Marty Abrams, that founds Mego, he sees an opportunity uh, to go make some science fiction space toys. And so previously in Japan, there had been a toy line called Micro Man from Takara. It's not called Micro Knots. Okay. And so Marty goes and he buys the American rights or the North American rights to Micro Man and he retitles it Micro Knots. And there are some changes in some of the character designs. And he then takes the ball and runs with that. And they do a comic at Marvel that again is written by Bill Mantlo, who wrote Rom. And uh, that turns into a huge hit, which is very similar to ROM. Micronauts lasted, I think, three waves of toys, so maybe three or four years, mm -hmm. and, whereas ROM just had one toy. And so Micronauts has some toy success, but eventually phases out, and the Micronauts comic 
far outlasts the toys. And it's important to note that not only were these series long lasted, long lasting, they sold really well. And so if you go back and you look in like an old issue of Amazing Heroes, and you look at like the best selling, top 20 best selling books, this is going to be mind blowing. Uh, like these books were outselling Captain America. They were outselling Thor. Sometimes they were outselling the Avengers. So yes, these books were really commercial and they sold really well. Why do you think that that was, right? Was it the combination to to your earlier point of of the comic and the toy? Was that part of it or were the comics just really well done? Yeah, I think the comics were done well. Um, it was also hard to explain how hot science fiction was and um, that whole kind of space storytelling. And then this is something that I'm going to be, I, I do not want to be hard on some of the comics that were published during that time period. But creatively, these years are not the high points for Thor or Captain America or some of the Avengers material. And so, uh, you know, Walter Simonson has yet to step on Thor during this, this era. And some of the more famous creators like John Buscema. And there, I mean, there's some creative high points in there and I could bore you to tears uh, analyzing it all. But, um, but basically there was real vibrancy and energy and excitement. And it was smack dab in the middle of a big trend. Got it. And, and, and I can tell you, there are people that love Micronauts. There is no doubt about that, right? I mean, I put up, like I did ROM, I put up a post of Micronauts and people were like, you know, liking this thing and sending me messages asking if they could buy copies. And I'm like, no, none of them were for sale. But like people are, are really excited about, about Micronauts. But to your point, the, the comic, the Micronaut comic was actually published originally by Marvel from 1979 to 1986, yep. but it didn't actually stop there, right? Because several other publishers, including IDW, have gone on to continue producing uh, Micronaut comics over the years. And I don't know if it's if it's um, printed now, but it had a, a long run originally and then subsequently to that. And it may speak to what you just talked about in terms of the, the convergence of science fiction, the toy, uh, how it kind of hit that sweet spot where things weren't necessarily good with some of the publishers, but this was great intellectual property. And people remember as they get older, those great characters and they go back to them. So I'll pause there to see whether you have any thoughts. Yeah, the the thing that really uh, got me on Micronaut is in the second or the third issue, there's a boy who's in his backyard uh, with a dog and the Micronauts come from the microverse, which is a tiny little universe, and they come into our world. And when they go through that transition, they come out the other side, the size of the action figures. Mm. <laughs> oh, man. how smart is that? <laughs> it's, it's Toy Story. <laughs> it's, it's genius, brother. That's it's what it Toy is. Story by way of Star Wars. And so I have my action figures Right. And all I want to be is the little kid in the backyard that's in the comic I'm reading, you know? That's and so cool. I think, you know, there, there's also that um, in the same way as like a space night, you mm -hmm. know, um, the simplicity of the concept there, or like for you, for GI Joe, like the notion of having many different friends that have many different skills, yep. you know, you go to school, you have many different friends, they have many different interests and many different talents. You always find these, nodes of like really mythic storytelling. And what happens is, is those underlying myths of like, you know, for GI Joe, the example is, you know, I get by with a little help from my friends, yeah. right? Like everyone knows that, right? But it's being dramatized in an action adventure story there. And I think uh, Micronauts had those same underpinnings where you had a varied cast. I in particular loved a Croyer and a Croyer uh, came from a planet that was filled uh, with these, um, let me know if you hear a common theme, these night-like um, spacemen, okay? And they were all, they were very much modeled on the original Spartans from Greece. They were like characters out of 300, but they wore power armor, okay? Mm -hmm. And so I loved those guys. They had some droids in there. Uh, you know, there was this cool character, Bug, who was part Bug, and he kind of was like Nightcrawler from the X-Men, and except that he was more sarcastic. And so the characters were really vivid and fun, but the key there is it's a ragtag band of outcasts in the way that Star Wars was. Mm. Where 
you know, it's Wizard of Oz. It's that kind of sense of look at all these different people. They have some weaknesses, but they also have some strengths. And I think that's a winning sort of like story um, structure and composition uh, that can be repeated. And I think it just as a publisher myself, I just see these uh, repeating themes and motifs that are very powerful. Now I have to read Micronauts. I, I have it. I've never read it. And now I feel I feel compelled to uh, to to dig into some micronauts, and I'll be looking for that little boy in the backyard with with the microverse that emerges. So I'm pumped for that. I'm pumped. And and I'll just put a little coda on it, okay. um, which is the first twelve issues of the original Micronauts run were drawn by Michael Golden. Mm -hmm. Now that name is important to you because he did Avengers Annual Ten, which is the first appearance of Rogue. So that's one of his historical accomplishments. But the key with Michael is that he is one of the most revered artists amongst other artists. So people like J.H. Williams III, who did Promethea, and Dave Johnson, who's an award-winning uh, comic book cover artist who does a million covers, uh, worship the ground from of Michael Golden. And he was a huge influence on them. And he's universally seen by the guys of his generation as a transcendent talent. And when you go back and you read these, and I was actually reading them to my six-year-old, my eight-year-old daughters, um, it's really powerful. Oh, I forgot the one, one central thing, which is I believe Michael was uh, the, the biggest influence next to George Perez on Art Adams. Mm. Art Adams. Okay. Style. And so I've never actually talked to Art about it specifically, uh, but I, I just see the, the common language artistically. So Michael Golden is a real giant uh, of the medium. And uh, I think you'll really enjoy seeing his work. And then there was great subsequent artwork by folks like Pat Broderick. You know, I, at conventions, I'll, I'll start a discussion. What, what long-running comic book had the greatest lineup of, of comic book artists? And so you invariably get into a conversation about Spider-Man. Oh, right? yeah. Well, that's where I immediately go because right. I'm a Spider-Man guy. Right. You bounce back and forth. And I then instigate because... I sneak in and I talk about Micronauts had Michael Golden, Howard Shaken, Pat Broderick, Gil Kane, who's the co-creator of Silver Age Green Lantern. Yeah. Eve Ditko, who's the co-creator of Spider-Man and uh, Keith Giffen. And it's a murderer's row of incredible talent. So yeah, I, you're you're, you're going to have me reading Micronauts. There's no doubt about that. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and add that one to my list, you know? So, I want to, uh, you mentioned something we were talking earlier off camera about um, Migo. And, yeah. and I want you to, to, to tell people, again, because I love these anecdotal little things. Where did the name Migo actually come from? So Marty Abrams had a little girl, a daughter, and she used to say to him when he was leaving, Migo, Migo with you, Migo, Migo with you. And so he named his toy company Migo. As a, as a guy with a daughter talking to a guy with daughters, that that resonates. I mean, that that's a cute story. No doubt about that. That's why I had to have you repeat that one for me. But I want you to check me on a few things here, because in my mind, things start to get a little interesting when you start to connect the dots. And I want to connect the dots. And as I connect them, I want you to confirm for me that I'm thinking about this the right way. So Rom was owned by Parker Brothers yes. and was purchased by Hasbro. That's right. And then we have Mego and Mego mm -hmm. went out of business and when they did, they too were purchased by Hasbro. That's right. And Hasbro also owns the very popular GI Joe and Transformers. Yes? That's right. All right. As I was doing my research, what I saw was that last year Hasbro actually acquired a global film and TV production house called Entertainment One or E1. And that company actually owned the very popular, according to my kids, Peppa Pig and PJ Masks, both of which have received a lot of my money. And they, Hasbro that is, now that they have Entertainment One, they also have an ongoing relationship with, with Paramount who helped them to produce many of their movies is is all of that correct and and would you would you modify anything in that statement 
Well, I wouldn't modify anything that's all correct. The one dynamic that I would point out is that the Transformers movies that Michael Bay made at Paramount were some of Paramount's biggest hits. Yes. And as Paramount looked to diversify and do other films like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, they were not nearly as successful. And so what Hasbro found itself in a position was that they were supplying some of the biggest hits to Paramount and being a gigantic company themselves, they thought, well, since we're this pipeline given, you know, sort of helping a film studio make this huge margin of profit, let's go buy our own film studio. And then we can control the pipeline and we can have greater say over how the material gets adapted. Yep, there you go. And, and and that was as I was doing my research and connecting the dots, it made sense, right? I mean, even though they have E1, they do still continue to partner up with with Paramount for for certain things like when it comes to distribution and even some of the production. But here's the thing. It is it in the realm of possibility to the point that you and I have just both made that Hasbro might be gearing up to release a ROM and or Micronauts movie or TV show either through E1 or through their relationship with Paramount? Is it is it is that too far a, a, a bridge for us to get across? Well, there has been a director announced for the Micronauts film. Okay. And I know that there is a script that's been reported on um, on websites. Um, you know, that's not uh, knowledge that I have uh, from behind the scenes. And I have not seen any reporting on ROM, but I would point out that IDW uh, did a universe where ROM and the Micronauts and G.I. Joe and Transformers are all in the same continuity. And there is absolutely conversation that they're having publicly about trying to have a Hasbro universe uh, that's, I think, under AllSpark Productions, you know, with Transformers mm. and having all that continuity married together. So um, I know that Micronauts is a priority for Hasbro to make as a movie. And I have not seen as much reporting on ROM. Okay. But it only stands to reason that that's one of the stronger things that's in their catalog that plays into uh, that uh, sort of s storytelling. Now, when I did my research, I did not see that a script was being developed or that a, a director had been named. So that that is indeed news to me. I mean, I saw that in years past, they were thinking about trying to do some things with an animated series, but I did not see that. It, I'm guessing that this is live action. If they have as a director, there's that's live yeah. action. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Okay. And, and that just goes to illustrate that there's a lot of information out there that I'm not necessarily privy to, but but thank you for uh, for surfacing that. So it, it, it seems that, again, that there may be uh, a path forward for them to do something uh, potentially around Micronauts because they're already headed down that path. But in what you're saying about IDW creating the share universe, that may also say something about what the future might be because everybody to some degree or another is trying to recreate the magic that has been made by the MCU with their 22 or $23 billion of success. Yep. Thoughts on that? Oh, absolutely. And look, you know what Stan, Stan, when he did that Marvel storytelling, he didn't invent the crossover or the team up. Uh, between uh, superheroes because that was invented at DC Comics when the Justice Society of America was created. Uh, but what Stan knew was that it's easier to sell the next thing when you're pushing off the last thing. So if you go and look at that glorious copy of Amazing Spider-Man number one that you have on the wall there, <laughs> what you'll see is the Fantastic Four are swirling around this new character, Spider-Man. Yep. And Stan did that to help sell Spider-Man to the people that were reading the Fantastic Four. Yep. And so when Marvel rolled out their cinematic universe, they obviously deployed that with their first four films. And it's just good marketing. It's just understanding, like, if you have a hit, the best thing to do is leverage your next um, project against that hit so that hopefully some of those people will follow over and watch your next thing. 
and, and, and the best what? custom the best customer is the customer you already have and if you can grow them right because to your point you can actually read ff and at various points in ff you see ads for hulk it's like who is hulk hulk is coming like i and i remember thinking you know what stan is a genius stan is a genius because sure. he is literate like at one point i do believe uh johnny storm was reading a comic in the comic yeah. about hulk which wasn't even yeah. out the dude is a genius you know yeah. and it's just it's really good marketing and as a marketer i appreciate that kind of stuff you know absolutely but, go ahead i'm sorry well and anybody who writes with great power comes great responsibility you know i would argue that's one of the greatest sentences of the 20th century okay could not argue against that um, but I want to touch on a point that you kind of uh, touched on a second ago in that um, Hasbro has had a lot of great success with the Transformer movie franchise and specifically the Michael Bay series, which was basically five movies, has grossed about five billion dollars. Only two of those were over a billion in and of themselves. So, but collectively, it's about five billion dollars. Now, when you contrast that to like the G.I. Joe franchise, those movies haven't done as well. I think that they gross collectively about three hundred and seventy five million, if memory serves. So um, with, with that said, you know, it, it might make sense to to do exactly what you alluded to, which is to create a shared universe to leverage the really popular to help out maybe the not so popular G.I. Joe, Micronauts, maybe even ROM down the road. And so there, there is a, a recipe there for them to have some great success. And the question will be, will they execute and go down that path? That's kind of my, my opening question. Well, now I'm going to give you a corporate answer. Okay. okay. So this is coming from a guy that runs a company. Okay. So Hasbro is traded on the stock market and they have shareholders. And when you do that, you get shareholders who call you and they ask you questions. You have to report to your shareholders literally. Yep. Okay. And so what happens then is every quarter your shareholders say, Hey, we have this giant franchise transformers that did insane at the box office and creates all these toys and in, in this sort of uh fantastical world we got gi joe over here what are you gonna do with that yep. and gi joe is a transformers just waiting to happen yep. and so there's consistent pressure that's going to be exerted on hasbro to exploit and i say that in a tone neutral way not negative way mm -hmm. to basically make a hit with all of their intellectual property but in particular, the most high profile. And basically in the modern media environment, your job is to do that until it works. Like you got to figure it out. And that's the way forward for the biggest companies. Now, as a corporate guy myself, I have literally been in the meetings with the CEO and president meeting with the shareholders. And those can either go incredibly well or not so well, where everybody feels awkward in the room, except for the person that is doing the the most talking. Um, so I, I think you're right about that, that they, they have an opportunity and they probably do have some great pressure. And the question will be, will they be able to execute? Because when you look at the data, the data would suggest that the, the Transformers franchise, as successful as it has been, is only the 13th highest grossing franchise out there. The number one is Marvel, the MCU at 23 billion. The, 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 the Transformers franchise is way down the list at like 13. And I think DC is 11 on the list. And so there is a big gap between the MCU and all of these other really fantastic franchises for them to be able to say, what can we do different? What can we do better? What can we borrow from what the MCU has done? Um, because that might be the path forward. Well, look, uh, you know, now we're really going to get less into facts and more into my opinion. So uh, one thing I would point out is that those Transformers films were made often before the Marvel movies were made. And if you go back and you look at the size of the box office 
for these kind of comic book movies, if we can lump toys and comics together, they increasingly get bigger and bigger and bigger. And basically the audience grows. So the further back you go, the mm. smaller the box office will be because each one built on the next. Got it. Basically, the girlfriends were like, oh, maybe I do want to watch this. <laughs> right? so, and, then the, and then the kids and blah, 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 and the audience gets huge. And so within that context, what I would say is that uh, Marvel is really pioneering an approach and you're going to see them combine Disney Plus with the upcoming WandaVision and Hawkeye and all the, you know, Falcon, uh, uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier that they're doing, where they're going to intertwine features and TV in a way that's never been done before. Yep. Uh, 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 beyond what they did at Netflix, more like you'll see the movies go into the TV show and the TV show influence the movies. And they're constantly innovating and creating the framework that others follow. But see, DC did an excellent job with Aquaman and did a great job with Wonder Woman, did an amazing job with Shazam. And they saw, you know, the sort of DC's approach was really guided by Zack Snyder and it to its tonality was trying to be consistent with the um, Christopher Nolan movies, which were the first, I think that the second movie, the second Batman movie that Nolan made was the first comic book movie to make a billion dollars. And so you have every financial incentive to continue that tone but they were finding that the tone really wasn't landing. And so then when Zach leaves the franchises, you see a differentiation in tone where Wonder Woman is much lighter and Aquaman is much more fun and the box office really opens up. Yeah. And so what you're seeing is a conversation happening in the market where people are adjusting and they're seeing different results and they're sort of experimenting and they're trying different things. And so to a certain degree, as you look at those box office totals, I think it's a little apples and oranges, or maybe it's different varieties of apples is a better way to put it, because it's different time period and it's under different market pressures. And Marvel clearly emerging at the top with the best strategy. But th there were two things that affect Marvel. One is the approach with the characters was always do the comics. Okay, that's very different. Like, I felt like with the G.I. Joe movies, and maybe this is unfair, and I, you know, let me know in the comments, but I felt like those original G.I. Joe movies, they were a little apologetic about the idea. They didn't really lean into it in the way that I'd seen it had been executed. And in the way the Marvel movies, I mean, they're like, here's a talking raccoon, and here's a talking tree, and let's go. And I either right. like it or don't. And right. everybody loves Groot and Rocket Raccoon. I'm sorry. And and to the yeah. to the point, don't be apologetic. Don't run away from the source material. Lean into the source material because there is something there. There is a fan base there that will show up because that that's their favorite character. And they're going to show up and they're going to bring their girlfriend or their buddy or the, all the nerds are going to get together and we're going to go because we dig it. And so to your point, those early G.I. Joe movies, I watched them all because I'm a G.I. Joe fan, but they weren't necessarily the best thing, right? Because they did not lean into and pay, pay homage to the comics. And now that I'm reading the comics, I'm like, oh, this is incredible. <laughs> I wish that they had done it. But here's the good thing. They have an opportunity. They have yep. an opportunity to do it different. And what they're doing is the Snake Eyes origin movie where they're going before all of the G.I. Joe stuff that we've seen and they have an opportunity to do it right this time. And if you look at the characters, the actors that are in there, there's some, there's some potential there. Yep, I'm excited about it. Now, the other thing that's different about Marvel is typically there's a producer who's producing the movie and they report to the studio. Mm -hmm. and the producer might think one thing and the studio thinks something else. I mean, just imagine sometimes picking a, a restaurant with your best friend is impossible, right? And that's your best friend. So imagine trying to make a movie with somebody that you really only know professionally. Mm -hmm. And maybe they don't like science fiction as much as you do, or maybe they like action more. It's very hard. Whereas Marvel, Kevin Feige is the producer mm -hmm. and he's the studio. So he gets to unilaterally make the decision and that em empower like the Marvel catalog is empowered by one person where the buck stops. And uh, those other films have all been mitigated. Even the DC movies are mitigated by the fact that it's a producer trying to collaborate with the studio. And Kevin is able to bring that thread, whatever that thread is, he's going to pull it all the way through. And this event over here lends itself to that. This one lends itself to something that comes later on. The way that, that they've orchestrated that is really, really beautiful. But 
it's being done by a guy, I think, that loves comics, that yes. loves the medium. And I think that that's an important thing that even if he selects a director that isn't as well versed in the comic, because he's the producer, he can still guide the ship to where it needs to go while still allowing that director to be creative because that's why he hires them, you know? Yes, absolutely. Marvel's done a brilliant job of building a team. And so we uh, at Boom, we have a lot of people that worked at Marvel that will come through, uh, on the cinematic side that will come meet with us. Like, I'm a storyboard artist and now I want to direct my own movie. And so I'm not, you know, Marvel's not ready for me to direct for them. Maybe I can find a project at Boom and I can direct them. And so I would always ask them all these questions about the process. And, you know, like I'll, I'll give you a tidbit here. So this is real insider trading. Okay. So the original Ant-Man movie, when it was being made, um, I talked to one of the screenwriters who ended up uncredited on that first film. And he was brought in after Edgar Wright. Okay. So Edgar Wright famously was attached for a long time, wrote the script, was going to direct it, and then left the project. Okay, And so this screenwriter came in afterwards. And what he told me, Edgar Wright had not started to direct the movie yet. Okay, And what the director told me was, all of the action scenes were done. So Marvel had VisFX people on staff, concept artists. You know, They had basically charted everything out. And the screenwriter, when they brought him in, they were saying, basically, we need you to do the character stuff, the dialogue, the drama that's happening. Fill, fill between, in the gaps. Between these action sequences. But we basically know what the movie is. And so when you think about that, they have this framework that they are supporting the director with. And you see people like James Gunn or Taika Waititi who are very clearly have their own voice. And they'll switch things around and da-da-da, whatever. It's not saying that Marvel's shoving this vision down people's throats. They're not. But instead, they have a very unique ability to support. Because, you know, the traditional studio system, a producer gets a project up and running. And then once it's shot, all those creatives go away. Well, at Marvel, they just roll the creatives into the next project. The next project, yeah. They've got this pipeline going. And so they've got all these folks that they employ full time. Whereas traditional VisFX artists or storyboard guys, they're freelancers and they got to kind of sing for their supper and they got to go, you know, beat the streets and go find out what, what assignments are available. So it's just, it's a very different structure that's built between Kevin Feige making the decisions where the buck stops and this entire support structure where they're just able to put things through the pipeline and they keep that consistency. So a director comes in, they're the experts on the character, they can support the director, they have the creative conversation, they're very collaborative and off they go. Check that out. I did not know any of that. That That is fantastic. And that again, speaks to again, maybe some of the success that Marvel has had because there is that consistency, there is that structure, there is that support system there. And they're not just cobbling it together for the sake of this movie. It is a, it is a structure that works that they just replicate time and time again. And again, $23 billion kind of speaks for itself in some respects, you know? But um, as we get ready to wrap this thing up, I wanted to take it back to comics for a hot second. Yes. We we know that that announcements around movies and TV shows and all this kind of stuff is like the driving force behind some of the values that we are seeing associated with comics these days. And and there are a lot of people that don't like that, right? I I, I completely respect it, but I personally feel like we are in a fantastic period because I remember Lou Ferrigno with green paint. And I say Lou Ferrigno with green paint instead of the Incredible Hulk because it was Lou Ferrigno with green paint. It wasn't the stuff that we are seeing right now in these movies and TV shows. But I'm, I'm curious, what does your gut tell you that might potentially happen with, in many ways, these undervalued comics that we've been talking about associated with ROM and Micronauts and potentially G.I. Joe and even Transformers? What does your gut tell you? Uh, the future holds for some of these comics that are associated with these intellectual properties? Well, look, as a fan of your show, uh, I love one of your expressions, which is the red ocean versus the blue ocean opportunity. And I, as a collector, I chase those opportunities myself. And so I look at the marketplace and I go, well, everyone is running over here and they're trying to get a copy of 
let's say, you know, uh, Marvel Special Edition 15 because Shang-Chi's coming, right? And so they're all chasing that. What's the next thing that nobody's looking at that nobody's thinking about? And I think these uh, properties are a great opportunity. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to drop my last thought bomb. Okay. So we've been talking about uh, Transformers, GI Joe, ROM, Micronauts, which are all under license with IDW. But the big property that we haven't mentioned yet that Hasbro owns that's being published in comics is the Power Rangers. Yeah. And you are talking to the publisher of the Power Rangers right now, right? Now, uh, there was a big announcement that just got dropped. Now, of course, we have Mighty Morphin number one and we have Power Rangers number one just came out back to back. And there was a huge announcement that Hasbro with E1 is developing a Power Rangers movie and TV show at the same time. And I think when you look at that, we all know how huge Power Rangers is and what a huge opportunity that is. And if you start to think about them threading the Power Rangers in with Transformers and using that to support G.I. Joe, and we have the information on the Micronauts that's on the internet, right? These things are starting to come together. And I would say there's a lot of opportunities there, right? And so if these things click and it starts to gel, you know, that could be a huge source of fandom. And all of these franchises, with the exception of Micronauts and ROM, are multi-generational. There's yes. a lot of Transformers, Power Rangers, and G.I. Joe fans of all different ages. And when you get things that are multi-generational, you in particular get uh, a lot of excitement. And, you know, collectability is a measure of fan excitement. It's a measure of how much people love things. And so, um, you know, I know some people might get upset about the price of back issues, but at the end of the day, I look at it as kind of like an economic index of love. You know, like, how much do I love Micronauts number one? I love Micronauts number one a lot. Okay, <laughs> I would pay a lot of money for it. I, I don't have to anymore because I went out and I got my nine my 9.8. And I got it signed by Michael Golden. And, you know, so, I'm, so I'm, you're golden, baby. Oh, I'm golden. Yes, I am. There, there was a lot in there. There was a lot. That expression at the end, that that just broke me right there. That There was a lot in there. Um, the, the thing about it is that Boom, in my opinion, is doing some really, really fantastic things. Thank you. And I have been saying that not because we were going to talk. I was saying that early on in, in like the pandemic, Thank when you. some of the statements that you were making publicly in press releases and posts, I thought came from a collector's place. Right. Not not from this. I'm a publisher. I'm all about money. But it came from, you know, I am a fan of comics. And when you read what you write or you you listen to you talk on Instagram, because I, I do that, I'm always impressed by how immersed you are in the hobby of comics. And it's apparent to me that there is a love for comics. And I think that that rings true when you see what you put out, but certainly over the course of this conversation with the history that you've shared, it's really fantastic. And, and I will tell you, you guys are putting out some fantastic content. Thank you very much. Fantastic content. I was reading the House of Atreides, which is yep. which is you guys. And, yep. and there are several other titles that I read uh, that I've actually released as hauls this week on my channel because you guys are doing some really good stuff. And, and I want to say um, thank you for agreeing to come on the show. Thank you for representing us as collectors in the industry. Um, I think that it it is um, being well received by the comic book community from everything that I see and hear people like Boom is doing a good job. Thank you so much. And look, you know, it really comes from the heart. You know, I was the kid that my parents would pay me two thirds of a comic book to do things like wash the car. Okay. <laughs> now, this was when comic books were 35 cents. So, how sad is it that I'm working for two thirds of a comic book? And of course, the genius of that was that if I did it twice, I got a comic book and a half. But if I did it four times, I could get three comics, which is a little over a dollar. Right. So, you know, I busted my hump for years and years and years to build my collection and uh, had the benefit of working at places like Malibu Comics 25 years ago, where I was able to work with legendary creators. And that really 
uh, sowed the seeds for the kind of Rolodex that I was able to launch Boom with in 2005. So look, I got here through a love of comics and I got here because of the people that paved the way for me. You know, uh, people like Keith Giffen, people like Paul Levitz that made sacrifices, Mark Wade, Dave Johnson. These are my friends that gave me a chance and they gave me a shot. And so to me, it's just all about passing on that love. And it's easy. I mean, it. you know, I fortunately, it's like you and I have jobs that don't feel like they're work, right? We get to do what we love. And a lot of people have to go to a job and we get to go do comics. Like we're very blessed and I'm only ever thankful for it. And I just love the fact that the fans want to talk. Like how much fun is that? You know, it's like, you know, I could be in a situation where I'm knocking on the clubhouse and everyone says, well, you don't get to come in because you're a professional, right? But it's just so much fun to me that everybody welcomes me into the clubhouse and I get to have a conversation with you about ROM and you're not sitting there going, hey, you publish Power Rangers, you you don't publish ROM, IDW publishes ROM, what are you talking to me about ROM about? You know, it's just, it's a, it's a comic, it's a thing I love from when I was a kid. I tell people all the time, like you can literally, if you are a true fan of comics, you can literally talk to somebody about comics around the clock every day because there are so many of us out there that can't necessarily talk about it in maybe the professional setting or in even our perf- personal settings, but we can make some friends uh, online virtually and have some really fantastic conversations. Uh, again, Ross, I want to thank you for thank making you. time to be on the show. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and I hope that the folks that are watching enjoy this as well. All of your details are going to be down in the description. I definitely encourage folks to follow you on the on the Instagram machine and everywhere else you are because you put out some really great content. But thank you very much. Thank you, Reggie.